Good morning and good afternoon. Uh, welcome to ARA's webinar Wednesday. Uh, I am Sri Rao, your moderator for today's webinar entitled Experimental and Numerical Performance of Cement Bonded Geomaterial Stabilized with Plastic Weight. Uh, I think you'll be glad you uh, joined today's webinar. This is a timely uh, and uh, cross cutting webinar that cuts across geotechnical, uh, pavement performance, and materials and sustainability. So there's many different things you can take out of today's webinar. Now I'd like to introduce our presenter and my colleague and someone who I work with quite a bit in the recent year, uh, Dr. Tanzila Tabasu. Uh, Tanzila is a staff engineer with the Transportation Division. Uh, she's located in Champaign, Illinois. Uh, Tanzila received her Bachelor's of Science in Civil Engineering from the Military Institute of Science and Technology in Dhaka, Bangladesh, uh, followed by her Master of Science at Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology. Uh, she then received her PhD in civil engineering um, and in the ge with a geotechnical focus from the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology, uh, where she also worked as a graduate research assistant. assistant. Her areas of interest include soil mechanics, ground improvement, expansive and cross susceptible soil stabilization, uh, soil erosion control, uh, self healing of soil, numerical modeling, and life cycle and sustainability analysis. Uh, and now I would like to turn the program over to Dr. Tanzila Tabasu. Tanzila, take it over. Thank you so much, Shri, for introducing me. And I welcome you all in my today's presentation. Uh, at first, I'm, I would like to give you a brief outline that's what I'm going to present today. At first, I'm going to introduce uh, you all about the importance of uh, thermal mechanical properties of soil and their some applications. And then uh, with the knowledge gap, um, as this uh, was a part of my like research in during my PhD, so I will describe about that how the experimental studies were performed um, with the results and the analysis. After that, uh, I will uh, describe about the numerical modeling that was the uh, yeah, 3D modeling of a pavement when it was uh, exposed to the weathering data. That how the numerical analysis was performed, and I will conclude my today's um, presentation and summarize the results and the findings. Um, soil thermal properties uh, play an important role in governing the phenomena of desiccation crack growth, frost heave, rate of heat removal, ice lens formation, and phase changes of porous media. In the uh, application of nuclear waste repositories, as it's shown in the very left side of the slide, like the nuclear waste are actually buried deep into the ground so that it cannot uh, exert the harmful heat to the environment. And uh, the soil around this uh, harmful waste, nuclear waste, uh, needs need to be like low thermal conductive so that the heat cannot flow to the atmosphere. Uh, and uh, for the like different slope stabilization or like the embankment slopes, desiccation cracks are observed uh, pretty commonly. So uh, when if the soil of an embankment slope is high thermal conductive, then it can uh, readily um, actually lose its moisture when it's summer season or when it's hot season. And then uh, the tension forces can develop in between the soil particles and eventually the soil may crack, like the desiccation crack may be observed. But when it's a rainy season, the water can percolate in between these cracks and weaken the slope and thus the failure of the embankment can be observed. Um, so uh, eventually for the application of the energy piles, depending on the if the soil around the energy piles are high thermal conductive or low thermal conductive, and the, if the weather outside is hot or cold, the energy piles can behave differently by absorbing the heat from the soil or exerting the heat uh, to the soil. So in different applications, um, soil thermal properties are actually very important. This slide shows um, like a typical cross section of a pavement, like a, uh, with a subsurface base layer, sub base layer, and a subgrade layer. Pavement is actually exposed to uh, like the solar radiation and wind and different traffic load, and uh, heat that is coming from the field. Um, the heat 
uh, that is coming on the surface layer of the pavement, like from the solar radiation or the traffic uh, load, can actually go uh, deep into the like different uh, pavement layers through the conduction uh, method of heat. Now, in the right-hand side, the figure that's showing that um, the different uh, stresses that is uh, like due to the temperature change and the wind load. So the longitudinal stress uh, that is coming from the temperature change of the atmosphere is actually more on the top of the surface, and it eventually gets like decreased uh, deep into the subgrade layer. And uh, but, like when the wind load in the, is coming to it like the longitudinal stress and the shear stress are also can be observed um, from the wind load. So uh, if there is an existing uh, transverse crack or joint present in the subgrid, this uh, stresses coming from the temperature and the wind load can eventually, uh, like, like uh, eventually can make this crack be more bigger and this crack can propagate to the surface of the pavement showing the pavement uh, distress and like mm, the pavement can fail eventually. Uh, this slide shows uh, some of the like uh, distresses that's been observed into the pavement, like pavement can buckle um, due to the like the temperature change of the soil, like the subgrade layer and like the frost heap damage are observed if the soil is frost susceptible. And uh, the excessive heat can actually cause the pavement to buckle, like, um, and it is um, uh, makes it uh, to be uh, like that cannot be used uh, for the uh, like the for the traffic, and also the rotting in pavement can be also observed. Uh, to uh, mitigate or to stabilize this type of problem, pavement problem, uh, researchers and practitioners are using different stabilizing materials so that they can alter the thermal property of the soil depending on the application. Whether um, the high thermal conductive soil material is required or the low thermal conductive soil material is required. Uh, usually cement, lime, and fly ash are used uh, to stabilize the soil particle when there is a requirement of the high thermal conductivity. And uh, uh, like the polyacrylamide and geopolymer or the aerated autoclave concrete are used when uh, it's the uh, need of a low thermal conductive building material. Uh, to uh, for the more sustainable planet for us, and uh, to minimize the waste, plastic waste from the environment, uh, researchers are performing a lot of research uh, by using uh, waste plastics or different kinds of waste so that it can be used in um, other well, like in a sustainable way to construct the building materials. Um, researchers have found that a different form by depending on different forms and grades of plastics, like maybe uh, the crumbs or pellets or fibers, the compressive strength or mechanical strength property of the soil can be increased or decreased. And uh, depending on the doses or the contents and the different forms that's been used to stabilize or treat the soil. Uh, but um, there is no uh, comprehensive study performed where uh, the recycled plastic service are being used to uh, satisfy the thermal mechanical performance of soil and that can be used in a pavement subgrid application. So to uh, fill up that gap, uh, the experimental studies were uh, subdivided uh, like into four different laboratory based tests, and then uh, the numerical analysis was performed to analyze the thermal and mechanical properties of the soil when it's uh, treated with waste plastic. Um, the laboratory tests such as the thermal conductivity test, potential volumetric change test, unconfined compressive strength test, and durability tests were performed. The variables that were used uh, to perform these laboratory tests were like the cement content, plastic content, plastic form, and curing taste. And the numerical studies were again subdivided by the validation of the model and then the application model. The materials that was used in this uh, research was the 
uh, the soil that was collected from the Cody Montana State Line Highway, and the uh, soil was classified as um, the clay sand soil, and the mineral that was present in it that was found from the XRD analysis was like this smectate mineral. So I want to mention that the smectate mineral is highly expensive and it, it expands a lot when it comes with contact of water. Um, as a binding material, um, industrially or like uh, commercially available Portland cement type one from uh, the doses of uh, starting from 7% to 12% by dry weight of soil was used to bind the soil material and the recycled plastics of HTPE small pellets, regrind flakes, and long pellets were used. The doses contents that were used in this study was uh, uh, 4%, 8%, and 12%, and they were used by the dry weight of soil. Uh, the collected or the candidate soil was uh, characterized, and as I said before, uh, the mineralogy that was found was the magnetic mineral, and it was uh, the, the USGS classification of this soil was FC soil, like, uh, and uh, the optimum moisture content of the soil was 24.9%. Uh, now I will just describe about the, how the soil was prepared for different um, uh, laboratory tests. At first, the soil was collected. Then it was paved after that with the saved soil. The required um, content of cement was mixed and um, it was mixed in dry basis. Uh, after giving a good mixture, uh, depending on the mix design, uh, either long pellets, small pellets, or grind flakes, um, the required uh, contents or the amount was mixed to the dry soil cemented mixture. After giving a good mixture, the optimum moisture content that was found, uh, this amount of moisture was added to it, and then the, it was uh, the sample that was required for each um, laboratory test were, uh, like, were prepared. Uh, the mixed designations. So uh, this slide shows that how the mixed designations were um, actually indicated or uh, were mentioned. If uh, the soil is like taken and it was mixed with different cement doses, as for seven, nine, and twelve percent. If the soil is first mixed with the seven percent cement with the small HTP pellets with the four percent doses of eight, the mixed design was designated as. 7C for HDPE. The HDPE indicates the small pellets. But when uh, the soil is mixed with the regrind flakes with the 4% of uh, content of 8, the mix designation is uh, actually indicated as 4RHDPE. The R indicated the regrind flakes. Similarly, when it's mixed with long pellets with the 4 percentage of 8, the mixed designation was indicated by like for LHDPE, the L denoted the long pellets. So all of the mixed designs with 7 to 12 percent of cement content and different uh, contents for the plastics, um, the mixed designs or the designations were indicated. Um, uh, for to determine the thermal property of the soil, like whether the soil is high thermal conductive or low thermal conductive, before and after the cement plastic stabilization, the thermal conductivity test was performed. Uh, this figure shows the TLS 100 millimeter sensor equipment. It has a four inch uh, long copper probe, which can heat and cool eventually, and this probe has to be inserted fully into the soil sample, and after a certain amount of time, this equipment gives the thermal conductivity of the soil sample. Uh, this test was performed in all of the mixed designs, and the results uh, showing that when the soil sample has no cement content on it, like it is 0% cement, uh, the thermal conductivity is actually a little bit low than when it's um, uh, than the cement content added to it. So as the cement content increases from uh, 0 to 12 percent, the thermal conductivity of the soil sample increases. This is due to the, um, the density of the soil sample mixture. Like the cement content actually in, uh, like, um, increases the density of the soil sample, and there is more particle-to-particle -particle contact. 
in between the soil and uh, there is more way uh, or the more flow path for the heat to flow. So thus, uh, due to the increment of the density, the uh, soil thermal conductivity increases because, because there is more uh, particle to particle contact. Whereas when um, the soil was mixed with different uh, plastic contents starting from 4 to 12 percent and depending on the different forms of recycled plastics like small rig grind or long pellets, the thermal conductivity decreases as the plastic content increases. This is uh, also due to the density, like um, as the plastic content increases, uh, the density of the soil mixture decreases because the plastics are have like having low thermal, sorry, low density, like 0.9 gram per cc than the cement and the soil itself. So as the plastic content is increasing, there the more volume is occupied by the plastics in the soil samples. So there is less per soil particle to particle contact and thus the thermal conductivity decreases because there is uh, uh, no a way to flow the heat, to conduct the heat. And um, like the minimum thermal conductivity was observed when it's mixed with 9% cement and 12% rig grind HTP, and it was almost 0.75. Uh, this, uh, the low therm thermal conductivity of the soil uh, sample when it's mixed with recycled plastics was also proved by X-ray computer tomography test. And the results, uh, like the images shows that um, there is actually air pockets in between the waste plastic and the soil matrix. And the air is actually very low thermal conductivity, it cannot conduct heat, and thus it's leading to show the low thermal conductivity of the plastic mixed soil samples. The results of uh, this thermal conductivity test is uh, the cement treated soils have higher thermal conductivity than the untreated soil, and the thermal conductivity decreases up to 57% when um, recycled plastics and cements are mixed to it. Uh, after the conductivity test, uh, potential volumetric change test was uh, performed uh, because, uh, as I mentioned, the soil is uh, highly soluble, like very expensive, so it may exert pressure into the uh, upper layer and that can eventually show the heave into the soil layer. So it is very important to determine if the soil is critical or non-critical to use in the application. Uh, this PVC meter was used uh, to determine the swell pressure that the soil exerts. And uh, as, uh, as I mentioned, that the so like swellable soil expands a lot when it's submerged in water. The results of this uh, PVC test showed that when there is no cement content, that is 0%, um, the soil is actually exerting a very high pressure that is almost uh, 300 kPa and it is indicated as very critical. But, uh, and that cannot be used in the field. And, but whenever it's uh, used uh, like 7% to 12% cement along with the plastics are being used to stabilize the soil, um, it exerts no pressure and uh, it becomes the non-critical. So the results indicated that the cement and waste plastics uh, can alter the soil sample from very critical to non-critical category. To determine the mechanical performance of the plastic treated soils uh, when it's bonded with cement, uh, the UCS test was performed, and uh, this is the figure of the UCS machine that was used, and this figure shows the uh, typical um, soil samples uh, that were tested with different doses and plastics of the soil sample. UCS test is important to understand the, how much load that the soil sample can take before failing, so it's very important, and it's also important to understand that if uh, the soil is going to satisfy the strength criteria for any uh, pavement application, like the soil subgrade strength criteria, if it's uh, satisfied that. And the results of the UCS test shows that uh, by increasing the cement content, um, the compressive strength also increases. And the after seven days, like, and the strength also increases 
from three days to seven days, like more the queuing days, more the strength is observed. And um, uh, this slide shows uh, the compressive strength of wet plastic mixed uh, soils after three days of curing period. These bar charts show their big compressive strength when they are mixed with 7 to 12 percent of cement and different doses of plastic. And after three days, uh, the maximum compressive strength was observed when it's mixed with 9 percent cement and 4 percent long HDPE. And uh, this uh, right hand side figure shows uh, the compressive uh, peak strength after seven days of curing period when they are mixed with different cement and plastic doses. Uh, and the maximum strength was observed when 9% cement and 4% long HTP was um, added to it. Uh, this is to mention that these two red lines are actually indicating that uh, what are the minimum strength requirement according to the state and federal highway. And it's showing that um, the minimum strength that is required for a rigid pavement for a subgrade layer is 1380 kPa. And for flexible pavement, uh, the minimum strength for a subgrade is uh, required as 1750 kPa. So the mixed designs that uh, actually goes up with this um, minimum strength criteria, so those can be used uh, as a subgrade mixed design in the pavement. The results of the UCS test um, shows that the soil uh, with 7 to 12 percent of cement doses and 4 to 12 percent regrant flakes actually satisfy the minimum strength criteria of subgrade layer when it's cured for seven days. Uh, durability, uh, after that, durability test was performed, and durability test was performed to understand uh, that how much. Uh, uh, the soil samples can sustain and can perform when they are exposed to unfavorable weather conditions. And um, uh, for this uh, test, um, repeated, like 28 repeated weighted, weighting and drying cycles were performed on the cement plastic treated mix design. And uh, this is to mention that um, the volumetric strain was uh, measured after each weighting and drying cycles to determine the ultimate uh, volumetric strain that a sample is actually observing um, after the durability test. Uh, the results showing that uh, the very left hand side, the four soil samples uh, showing that it has more uh, weight loss of the soil, like the soil is actually losing due to the repeated weighting cycles, and these four uh, uh, samples are actually mixed with low cement content, that's 7%. But in the right-hand side, the four samples are showing like the, like the soil when it's treated with 9% uh, cement and different doses of plastic. So it is very clear that uh, low doses of cement contents uh, is actually, when it's mixed with low doses of cement contents, the soil samples are actually uh, losing more of its weight than the higher doses. And uh, this right-hand side figure shows when it is mixed with 0% cement, that is no cement in it, after just one waiting cycle, the soil completely failed. It failed uh, on its own weight, like it cannot sustain or it cannot be run to the second cycle. And <clears throat> the weight loss uh, for the 7% cement is more than the 9% cement treated samples. Um, so, and the, like the minimum uh, weight loss was observed as only 10% uh, when it's um, mixed with 8% uh, big grind HDPE. And the uh, maximum volumetric change that was observed after 28 wetting and drying cycles, it's showing uh, this figure, like a minimum of 4.6 and uh, like a 4.8 percent of volumetric change was of, strain was observed when 9 percent cement and 9 percent cement and 8 percent regrind HTP flakes were used. And so, uh, uh, like the uh, Portland Cement Association says that when it's uh, the volumetric change is less than 10 percent, then it's uh, actually in um, like it, it fulfills the performance criteria. It can be uh, applied into the field and it's observed like satisfactorily. The results showing the durability cycle shows that the increased cement content uh, actually reduced the amount of soil loss 
due to the repeated uh, durability cycles. And the um, soil samples that are treated with higher doses of cement and plastics of regrant planks, they actually fulfill the criteria of maximum allowable volumetric change, that is less than 10%. After this uh, laboratory test performance uh, performed, uh, the numerical studies was um, evaluated and the, uh, it was subdivided into validation of the model and the application model. Uh, for the validation of the model, uh, the thermal conductivity test uh, equipment was used and uh, um, two uh, thermocouples are, were used to determine the heat flow of, throughout the radial direction of the soil samples. Like the thermocouples can actually uh, capture the heat or the temperature uh, while heating and cooling of the thermal probe of the uh, thermal conductivity equipment. And um, the numerical model, uh, it was uh, to investigate the heat transfer mechanism and the performance of the plastic cement treated soils with the changing thermal uh, temperatures, like the, a 2D axisymmetric module was selected to represent the soil material. And for the calibration of the numerical model with experimental data, the thermal conductivity test values of the soil were used and their material properties were used as an initial parameter in the model. Um, in this model, uh, we, uh, like uh, the thermal probe of the equipment or the test equipment was modeled as a copper probe, like it was also in copper probe in the um, thermal conductivity equipment. So it was modeled over here in the middle as it was inserted in the middle of the soil sample and with respect to the time, um, it uh, shows that it is heating and then cooling, and uh, uh, it was modeled like that so that we can, um, so that it can actually uh, calculate the heat throughout the cross section of the um, model. Uh, this slide shows um, the actually the figure, the typical figure of the 2D axisymmetry model with their boundary conditions and the meshing of the like model itself, and to investigate uh, to the, this um, numerical analysis, <clears throat> the heat transfer in solids module was used, and um, the solar radiation module was used. And uh, this is to mention that assigning the physics, and then uh, after assigning the boundary conditions and uh, putting the initial parameters, then it was uh, run as a time-dependent analysis so that we can uh, actually replicate the real situation to the model. And after that, uh, the analyzing and visualizing the results were performed or done. Uh, for the validation, uh, the experimental, in the experimental analysis, as I mentioned that the thermal probe was heating and cooling with respect to time, uh, it was noted uh, with, like how much the temperature is showing uh, throughout the cross section of the area through the thermocouples and uh, by using the appropriate thermal source or heat source and heat flux, the numerical model, uh, the, like the temperature of the probe was also observed. So the numerical and the experimental analysis shows that the close resemblance of the temperature data um, because the maximum difference between the temperature of the numerical and experimental analysis was not uh, like too high, it was less than a degree. So it was considered to be you know, like a acceptable uh, range or satisfied range. Uh, now the application model, as um, our application was uh, in the pavement model and the subgrade and the, the subbase layer, it was simplified and was uh, with the boundary conditions. This, the second picture, the right hand side is actually showing the model. So it has a subgrade layer of 0.3 meter, and uh, with the uh, subbase layer and base layer, it was assumed like together it is 0.5 meter in thickness, and it was exposed to the ambient uh, temperature and heat flux. Uh, in to uh, use this uh, like numerical analysis, a multi-physics software of uh, like named Comsol, it was uh, this software was used, and Comsol has the weather data present in it. So uh, as a weather station data, 
uh, for the rapid city South Dakota, the highest temperature that was observed in that uh, area, it was recorded uh, or it was available in the weather station data. So that uh, specific day that was used to expose this pavement, like to observe the thermal behavior of this pavement, the day temperature data was used and the model was run. So uh, it was actually exposed to the solar radiation of the atmosphere. and how the heat is conducting or how much is the thermal profile, what is the thermal profile throughout the cross section of the pavement was observed. Uh, this is to mention that uh, to observe uh, the thermal behavior of the soil subgradient, the low thermal conductivity value that was observed from the laboratory experimental analysis was used as the initial parameter and the high thermal conductivity uh, that was observed uh, that a uh, five watt per meter per Kelvin that was used as an initial parameter. So the pavement watt model was actually uh, like the material properties was different. Like one time it was uh, the thermal conductivity of the soil was low, and again it was high. So that it can be different. It can differentiate that how the heat is actually transferring throughout the uh, pavement layers. How to how the thermal profile is changing when it is uh, low thermal conductive um, and uh, with respect to the high thermal conductive. This performance was observed for the subgrade. Uh, this is actually the typical uh, 3D temperature di distribution of the pavement model at a certain time. And uh, the model was actually run for a day for the low thermal conductive and the high thermal conductive material for the both of uh, like the material properties and the, the analysis that is showing over here in the slide. Um, this slide shows actually that the, from which thermal um, like profile was uh, taken into account. Like for the as I mentioned, the pavement subgrade lower layer was 0.3 meter and it was the upper two layers was like 0.5 meter. So there was a 3D cut plane for the temperature distribution profile. And on the top of the right-hand side picture, A picture shows when the soil subgrade layer is made of low thermal conductive at the very joint of the subgrade layer and the subbase layer that is at 0.3 meter, the temperature difference for a day is not that much. Like um, the temperature difference is not too much. So it's very low temperature difference. So in a day, if it is constructed with low thermal conductive material, the temperature fluctuation that will occur in the pavement subgrade layer is not that much. Uh, but whenever uh, the soil material, like the subgrade material, is uh, constructed with a high thermal conductive material, after one day of uh, the solar radiation or when it's exposed to the heat of the atmosphere, the temperature uh, actually fluctuates a lot in the whole. Uh, some grid layer and at the 0.3 meter um, uh, depth in the second picture, like in the B picture, it shows that it actually uh, goes like more uh, temperature difference than the low thermal conductive material. This uh, behavior is actually clearly, can be clearly observed with this, pic, like the fourth figure, like the left hand side bottom figure. When uh, the green line shows the thermal conductivity for a day, uh, it shows that when it is a constructed with low thermal conductive material, the temperature difference is not too much, like point, uh, it's like 25 degree to 24.2. Uh, wherever it, the temperature difference is more when the subgrade layer is actually constructed with high thermal conductivity material, and the, there is more temperature fluctuation in just one layer. So this is very important because. If a um, soil layer can actually go uh, repeated, um, like this flux temperature fluctuations, and uh, in just one day, the fluctuation is more, temperature fluctuation is more, then it can actually have more thermal stresses on it. And this thermal stresses can eventually lead to thermal distresses, like uh, thermal cracking can happen, and uh, like contraction, expansion, you know, just um, within, uh, like some time or a day or two, or maybe um, within a few days, there will be more contraction expansion due to this uh, temperature change and warping, curling, this uh, 
problems uh, may be happening to this uh, pavement. So uh, this uh, uh, is very important to understand uh, the behavior, thermal behavior, to have the thermal profile of a soil subgrid layer to, uh, uh, to design a pavement uh, and to take account like how much contraction expansion that it can go and uh, to design the pavement for warping and curling um, situation. Mm, so for the um, an, uh, numerical analysis um, and uh, the um, laboratory tests, uh, these are the uh, conclusions or the summary that can be found. Like uh, the cement uh, treated soil samples has the high thermal conductive and conductivity, and, but when the waste plastics are used in it, the thermal conductivity can be reduced. And uh, with the waste plastics uh, adding to it, up to 57% decreased thermal conductivity can be obtained. And um, the soil pressure can be actually, uh, like can be from very critical to non-critical when uh, cement and recycled plastics are mixed to the soil sample. And the compressive strength uh, is actually showing that uh, when the recycled plastics are mixed in, into it, uh, with the cement, desired cement doses and uh, desired waste plastic contents, uh, the some of the mixed designs can actually satisfy the minimum strength criteria of the soil pavement layer. And uh, the durability test showing that increased cement content can uh, reduce the total soil loss amount um, and uh, the maximum allowable volumetric change criteria, uh, like the soil cement mixed with the certain doses of cement and plastics can actually satisfy the maximum allowable volume change criteria, that is less than 10%. And the multi-physics model uh, showed a close resemblance uh, with the laboratory specimens and the simulation in the climatic condition concludes that the cement plastic stabilized soil performs superior with respect to the pavement distresses and uh, due to the temperature changes and the thermal cracking and rotting. And these are some of the publications that uh, actually uh, come out from this uh, research. And uh, I thank you all for watching and listening. I hope you find this subject interesting. Uh, now I will turn the webinar back over to Shri. Thank you very much, Tanzila. Again, I apologize to everyone for the audio gremlins we had uh, on this webinar. Uh, however, if you have any questions, please begin submitting those uh, now, and Tanzila will answer as many as possible in the time available. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, to submit your questions, use the Q&A portion of, the, uh, of your screen uh, on the WebEx interface. We hope you enjoyed today's presentation, and if you will join ARA for future webinars, uh, the next two webinars are shown on your screen. Uh, the first one is in January, uh, GPR, What Can Squiggly Lines Really Tell Us? Uh, that's from by Merv Su. And um, in February, Abu Sufyan will talk about tracking and bonding performance of commonly used tack code materials in asphalt pavement. We have many more exciting topics and presenters in the works for 2023, so please watch your email for updates or visit the webinar Wednesday webpage uh, to register for upcoming webinars. Um, I have a few questions for you, Tanzila, so we'll get to it. Uh, and then we'll wrap up the webinar. Um, a quick question by Abu. Is there any reason that the soil sample was collected from the Wyoming, Montana region? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much, Abu, for the question. Yes, uh, so this uh, project was funded uh, uh, by uh, uh, Hawthorne Foundation and uh, from Wyoming. So they have observed a lot of uh, like swelling uh, behavior of the soil and some heaving activities of the due to the soil in the pavement. So uh, that was the reason that why uh, the soil was collected from that region. And uh, they were like, like how, how this can be, this problem can be stabilized. So to address this problem, uh, the soils were collected from that exact location. All right, thank you. Uh, there's a question. Um, by Corey, who says any environmental impact considerations uh, as a result of the use of recycled plastics in the subgrade. And I know you focused on some of the technical details, but can you talk about any environmental impacts 
or considerations? Um, oh yes, uh, thank you so much uh, for this question. Uh, yes, uh, um, Open LCA, Open Life Cycle Analysis software was used uh, for each and every mixed designs uh, to determine the sustainability index and the life cycle and like uh, uh, that how much is the environmental impact like with respect to the carbon emission, embodied energy, eutrophication factors, uh, uh, like uh, how much is the global warming, how much is the human um, affecting factors, ecotoxicity factors, those all were actually evaluated for each and every mixed designs. However, uh, those were not presented over here in this, in this uh, presentation, but uh, um, there is actually a journal publication in the um, Journal of uh, Materials, in ASC Journal of Materials and Civil Engineering. So it was actually published over there. So uh, you can definitely find those environmental impact uh, results uh, there. Yeah. So, um, Danzilla, there's a similar question uh, from Matthews. Um, what are the environmental impacts of adding waste, plastic to subgrade? And can you just Briefly, in a sentence or two, or, or in, a, in a minute or so, mm -hmm. summarize what you found in terms of using plastic, and then the follow-up question also is: Did you look into cost as well? Uh, yes, of course. Um, thank you. But uh, it's the answer of this environmental impact of adding recycled plastics into it. Is it a good or bad? It's not uh, that pretty direct. So depending on the amount of the plastic, that how much we are actually. Uh, using the plastic, is it 4%, 8%, or 12%? And also, the cement doses are also changing. So, and uh, that was also calculated that if we are adding waste plastics, can we also reduce the amount of cement content from the soil sample mixes so that we can get the, um, uh, like almost similar the strength out of thermal performances? So, depending on the dosages of the soil, sample, uh, sorry, dosages of the plastic content, and different forms, and also for different uh, plastic, uh, sorry, cement doses, the sustainability index or the environmental impacts, those are actually changing. Uh, so the values, they are like uh, coming different for different mixed designs, but if we just uh, can call it like a typical, if the soil sample has low plastic content in it, it will, uh, for the environmental uh, like side, it's going to be better. But also we have to think that uh, there is also plastic pollution in the environment. Uh, but if we add or use more plastic contents in it, we are actually indirectly using the waste from the environment too. So it is like that, like no direct answer of yes, it is good or bad, but uh, if the doses plastic is less, it, uh, the environmental impact um, number that is coming from the software, like the analysis, is actually low, that I can say. All right, thank you. So uh, mm -hmm. that does answer the question. Uh, here's the question from Melissa. What are the typical sources for the plastic pellets? Are they a byproduct, or do they need to be manufactured specifically for this application? Um, so uh, uh, we had a lab. So these uh, plastics were actually prepared uh, by collecting the waste plastics from the um, transfer divisions of like rapid city landfill. So they were actually transferred, cleaned, uh, washed, and then crushed. And some of them were actually um, extruded to uh, define different forms and shapes. So they are actually both like uh, the crushed are actually just uh, bringing them, washing and crushing randomly. And uh, the other one was actually definitely prepared of different size and shapes for just to uh, perform in this uh, research. All right, thank you. Um, Saleh Kosak asked, is there any, was, did you perform any leachage tests uh, on this study um, from metals, for metals, VOCs or SEOCs? Yes, yeah, so leachate tests were performed on this uh, waste mixed uh, plastic soil samples, but uh, it was actually the leachate test showed that uh, the soil samples are giving a satisfactory leachate results because those are actually cement bonded, compacted. So there is almost no like leachate has been observed for the microplastics of this uh, 
like wet plastics. So yes, the leachate tests were performed and those were actually uh, showing satisfactory results. All right, thank you. Uh, Louis Gray asked, uh, Las Vegas, Nevada reaches uh, 35 centigrade. Have you performed any studies in this kind of roads with hydro expansive soils and high temperatures? Mm, no, not uh, this type of analysis were done. No, there is no analysis like that. Okay, uh, but I, I'm, I'm guessing that you could do something similar based on mm -hmm. some of the work you did, uh, the modeling and so on, correct? Yeah, sure. I believe that's all the questions we have. Um, I think there is, oh, wait, there's a couple more questions. Sorry, I, I missed this. Uh, what was the basis for choosing the cement dosages that you chose? Uh, so, according to the published reports, uh, it was mentioned that um, if a soil is uh, like SC, uh, USC is classified like SC soil, then the minimum um, Cement crack uh, dosages that uh, need to be used is 7%. So to uh, keep in mind, like we want to sh uh, see the variables um, and how the soil performance is changing with respect to the different binding metals like the cement dosages. So uh, the 7, uh, 9, and 12% doses were chosen accordingly. So the minimum uh, cement required to establish SC soil is 7%. So that was the actually uh, starting uh, content for choosing the cement doses. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, another question um, is from uh, Kumar, who says, "Are the properties of the recycled plastics different than the virgin plastics?" Uh, no. The uh, the recycled plastics uh, that these uh, plastics were tested um, in a laboratory. Their uh, tensile uh, test, flexure test, their um, density test, and their water absorption capacity, their hardness test, all these tests were actually performed in the laboratory, and they actually fall into the range of the values of the virgin plastics. So these uh, recycled plastics actually will not behave differently than the virgin plastics. So the properties values actually falls into the range. All right, thank you. Um, Dennis uh, asks, uh, it seems instrumented field trials of this technology will be quite beneficial. Um, have you or do you know of any instrumented test section field trials that have been planned or performed? Um, I, I have um, read some of the articles like um, in Texas, there are actually, they're not um, like there are plastic pins that's been actually um, uh, like they are actually testing that in the field instead of just mixing uh, different uh, plastic forms like in um, a small or long pellet size. So they are actually making big plastic pins to stabilize the slope. So it's a different uh, direction like uh, or a different type of uh, like form they are using the pins or the big pins. Uh, but they are actually doing some of the uh, tests over there in Texas. All right, thank you. Um, here's a question from Amy. Um, why did uh, you choose the high density polyethylene HDPE over other plastics? Mm, yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, this is a good question. Like uh, on the EPA data, it shows uh, that the most uh, uh, the plastics that's been found in the landfill is the HDP, and uh, HDP actually uh, contains like uh, almost or more than like more than 37 percent of the total municipal solid waste. So HDP is the mostly found in the landfill. Like most of the plastics that are in our environment are HDPE. So it is uh, good to if we can reduce the HDPE pollution from the environment. So that's the reason that uh, why uh, this HTP plastics were chosen other the, over the other plastics. I think I have one last question for you. Um, this is uh, from uh, Robert. Uh, can these plastic mixed soils uh, satisfy strength criteria of the subgrade? Uh, yes, uh, so uh, I have uh, presented that um, some of the mixed designs when they are treated with 9% cement and regrind flakes, uh, those uh, mixed designs actually satisfy the strength criteria for pavement um, flexible 
and rigid pavement uh, subgrade layer strength criteria. Yes. That's it. Thank you. I, I believe I did see some of those slides. Um, again, thank you everyone for your questions. Uh, and uh, we have just a few more minutes to we'll wrap up this webinar shortly. If we did not get your question, Tanzila has agreed to answer questions for the next 24 hours via email. Uh, we just ask that you please make sure your questions are not consulting questions. On behalf of ARA, thank you for joining us today. Today's presentation is being recorded and the link will be made available on the ARA webinar Wednesday website early next week. Uh, we will also send a PDA certificate to all participants verified by our attendance report as present for the full hour of the webinar. A copy of today's presentation